Tak dobré odpoledne, spolek. Jsem moc rád, že vás můžu přivítat na první přednášce, která je věnovaná našemu velkému tématu, a to je téma Stop Motion v souvislosti s výročím Míří Otrnky. Jak víte, celý festival je protchnut loutkou animací, nebo obecně řečeno Stop Motion animací. A začneme právě Clay Animation, což je právě taková technika animace, která vlastně člověk ani nenapadne, že je loutková. A proto, proto se využívá toho termínu stop motion, kdy prostě se e, mluví o pohybu nějakého objektu, nějakého materiálu, e, něco, co je v prostoru a nějakým způsobem se s tím pohybuje. A může to být právě i, i nějaká tvarovatelná hmota, plastelína, hlína, e, obecně i clay animation. Jsem moc rád, že tady můžu přivítat univerzitního profesora ze Spojených států, z univerzity v Severní Kalifor- e, Karolíně. Uh, Michaela Frierzna a tím mu předávám slovo. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, if you'll bear with me, I'll just read a little bit to begin. First, I wanted to thank all the festival organizers and the volunteers for the work they've done. I don't get to go to many animation festivals, but this one's very exciting because of the connections between all the puppet animation that you'll see this week. So, basically, I would like to just talk about a few ideas I have about history of American clay animation, which is very, it's a narrow topic in some ways. But um, my idea is that if we can look at a few themes that emerge in American clay animation and some of the trends that come all the way into the 1990s and the present, that I, I believe that you'll see a lot of connections across all of the puppet films that we're going to see this year, uh, this, this festival in NFS 11. It's a pretty amazing lineup of films, particularly the collection of British puppet animation that uh, Paul Wells and others have assembled. So I'm very excited to be here, and I really appreciate you coming out to hear, to hear this. Um, so I wrote a book in 1994 about the history of American clay animation. And one of the things I did is just go back and research the, the, the origin of the term plasticine. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, there was a man named William Harbert who developed a modeling material that was softer than ordinary plastilina, which is the Italian version of modeling material. And he developed a system where he thought he would take and replace writing in uh, English schools at the turn of the century with a system of using clay on tablets to, learn, to teach children how to write. Prior to this, they're writing with chalk on chalkboards. So plasticine was actually developed to be an educational tool in English schools at the turn of the, of the century, 19th century. So I just love to see these slides because we're shooting photographs and we're sculpting clay to demonstrate exercises for students, but it suggests very early on where clay animation would come from. We see a series of sequential images in his book in Harbert's book, which are fairly clearly a sequence of shots in clay. So I, I find these photographs really interesting and one of the early antecedents for clay animation in the United States and, of course, in other parts of the world. The other, the other thread is, you know, John Stuart Blackton in the United States, who was an Englishman who came to the United States. You may know, does anyone know the work of Blackton? He's uh, one of the original founders of the Vitagraph Company in the United States and is considered the father of American animation, uh, made the first film in the United States called Humorous Phases of Funny Faces, which is basically a series of sketches. And that movie grew out of a, tech, of, of a vaudeville technique in the United States. We say vaudeville or live variety stage program, where an artist would go to a board and sketch quickly and tell a story and do a series of sketches and present essentially a lecture through a series of quick hand-drawn sketches. Um, Blackton was a reporter for a New York newspaper and went to the Edison studio and made one of the earliest Edison. He was doing an interview with Edison, Thomas Edison, at the time. And Edison encouraged him to come into the Black Mariah, which was the original American studio and do a film of one of his lightning sketches. So lightning sketches is another one of these sort of antecedents to drawn animation, because we have an artist working at a board and working very quickly. Um, 
What's interesting is we see that same sort of technique in clay. There were actually lightning sculptors who performed in vaudeville shows in America on the stage. And they would give a series of talks and jokes in a live presentation, very much like magic, where they'd turn away and sculpt and then turn back to the audience. And so I wanted you to see this film very quickly. It's a one reel film from the Edison studio. It's only a minute long. The limitation in the American studios at the time was they had no loop in the camera, in the film camera. So the, the longest roll they could film with was one minute long. So this is actually from the paper print collection in the United States Library of Congress. When, when animators, I'm sorry, when filmmakers would make films at the turn of the century in the United States, you actually had to make a paper print and file that with the copyright office in order to get the copyright for it. So these are actually, they take the paper prints of the film and recreate them. So it's a very poor quality print, but it is this idea of sculpting quickly, lightning sculpting for a motion picture. And you can see in it stop motion substitution where they stop the camera, change the image behind, you know, freeze, stop the camera, change the image behind, and then go back into the animation. So the plots in these sorts of films are very short and generally end with a kind of gag at the end. The protagonist is punished. What? End of film. So that's an interesting film because it was shot at the Edison studio in 1902 by Edwin S. Porter, who went on to become a very famous American director in the silent period and did films like The Great Train Robbery, which you may be familiar with, a fairly famous American film from the first period. The other sort of thread that you see in the early period is Tableau Vivant, where people would strike poses in the, in the position of famous photographs and hold those. Um, it moved into the vaudeville stage again, into the variety stage, where they would have basically nude women performing on stage, striking the poses of famous uh, sculptures and paintings. And so it was an opportunity to see people naked on the stage in the United States. And these shows were very popular initially, but were shut down very quickly in New York and other places like that on the variety stage. But this notion of the sculpture that comes to life is one that recurs over and over and again in early period. And the very first film that uses that, I'll show you in just one second, it's called The Sculptor's Nightmare. One of the things that's happening in this very early period is we're moving from storefront theaters, which were very uh, disreputable places for people to see motion pictures, into the first theaters built ex explicitly to show motion pictures. So I've always loved this slide because it shows the idea that there can be cultural uplift, moral uplift in motion pictures. Now we can have women and children move into public spaces that are acceptable for families to see motion pictures. And one of the films that emerges in this period is a film called The Sculptor's Nightmare. The first, well, it's not the very first clay animated film in the United States, but it is the first that still exists. And it's interesting because it has in it D.W. Griffith as an actor, who was a great American director in the silent period, and Max Sennett, who went on to do Keystone Cops in the United States. Um, it's a very, in this early period, all the American motion pictures are essentially like a series of slides for magic lantern shows. Each shot is a separate entity unto itself. So there's no real editing in these motion pictures. We're before the period where we had matched action, cut on action, that sort of thing. So in this film, it's a real weird film. It refers to the election in 1908 in the United States. And this is a basically a political convention. They go to a sculptor's studio, give him lots of money to sculpt 
busts, which was the traditional popular form of American sculpture at the time, of current political candidates who had run in the election. So what does an artist do when he gets a lot of money? He goes to a restaurant and gets drunk. He's arrested and thrown in jail. And this is just a sort of an excerpt of what happens to him in that period. These films are very slow, and they refer to, obviously, they're looking back to the earlier style of stage acting. So in this form of filmmaking, we don't have a way to suggest the dream sequence. So we stay in the long shot, and these figures just pop in. We're supposed to understand that this is a dream. In a lot of uh, uh, American films from the time, the playbill, the printed page that was handed out to people with to come see the movies, that's where the narrative lie. You actually had to read the playbill to understand what was happening. So this is a very odd sort of dream sequence for us today. So again, this film was shot by Billy Bitzer, who became Griffith's cameraman throughout his career, shot Birth of a Nation and all of his longer films. Bitzer, like many of these early animators, was very interested in magic shows. American Mutoscope and Biograph Company that he worked for initially sold magic tricks to people. So Bitzer, like many, many early animators, is interested in magic. This is obviously a reverse take from the paper print collection. He throws in a couple little images like birds and monkeys. So obviously we switch to running in real time with the camera and the exposure changes a little bit. The shutter speed is slower. And this is some live action sequence in the middle. And then here's some actual frame by frame animation by Bitzer. So one of the things that would happen when they would show these films in a theater in 1908, the theater was considered a place where people did not have to be quiet to watch the films. So it would become part of a, a situation where political parties, I might yell out, hooray for you know, Bryant, the Democratic candidate. Another person would holler out, hooray for Fairbanks. You know, so they would have these kind of back and forths uh, give and take political discussions right on the scene as the film played. And this last image refers to Theodore Roosevelt, the American president. He became famous at the turn of the century, actually infamous, because he shot a, a young bear on a hunting trip in Alabama. And he became associated with the bear, which in America became known as the teddy bear, Theodore Roosevelt. I don't know if that's the same translation here, but... Um, one of the larger-than-life figures in American uh, his political history and then sort of tied to this image of the teddy bear, which became a very popular children's toy in the United States. So most of these films are a little weak in the ending. I mean, there's really no resolution. He just passes out. I, I do want to throw this in because... As far as I can t determine, the earliest known female animator in the United States was not someone who did drawn animation, 
but Helena Smith Dayton, who did clay animation in 1917. Her work was written in a, a traditional scientific journal in the United States called Scientific American. And so unlike this sort of magical use of clay on one side, her, her image of how clay animation would grow uh, really is more in the vein which became the dominant medium, which is clay puppets, essentially. Um, so I just find it interesting that in a, in a medium that's essentially a bit of a marginal medium in American animation history, we find the first female animator in the United States. So even within studio productions in the uh, 1920s and 30s, there are occasional uses of clay. Do you know the Out of the Inkwell series here, the Flesher Brothers series? Flesher Brothers are the directors of Popeye, Betty Boop, those sorts of commercials from the 1930s. And they've had a regular production series with a figure called Coco the Clown. And basically, Coco's function is to come off the drawing board and run amok in the studio. So in this instance, a man comes in to have a bust sculpted of him. Coco runs up inside the nostril of the sculpture, and the sculpture comes to life. I won't show you that film because I don't have time. But I think it's interesting, even in a studio series cartoon, there are occasional uses of clay. And I'm sure you know this, the general idea that, I mean, by the 1920s in the United States, and I guess around the world, in many places, 2D, 2D animation, drawn animation, first with the slash system on paper, and then cell animation through the 1920s, became the dominant medium. So there's very little clay animation between, say, 1921 and all the way into the 1960s. Because, as you know, or may not know, I don't know, uh, cell animation has advantages of division of labor. You can have inkers, opakers, people who do keyframe animation. So that system could be made into a factory system where you know, one, you, have, you break up the task into many, many small specialized tasks. So clay is pretty much non-existent between the 1920s all the way into the 1960s when the cartoon system in the United States begins to collapse, the studio system. The sort of exception to this comes in the 1950s with Art Clokey. And he's the inventor of Gumby. You know Gumby, right? You've seen Gumby films, right? He's a big, big star in America. Um, Cloakey's interested, be, interesting because his primary instructor was a Russian filmmaker named Slavko Vorkopich, who worked, who escaped Russia and came to the United States and earned a living doing Hollywood montage sequences. So the most famous of these kind of things are spinning newspaper, you know, Rocky to go to the electric chair, you know, you know, Rocky released from prison. Those, those sort of uh, narratively summative uh, montage sequence. He made an entire living doing that. And he taught Cloakey very much um, sort of fundamental aesthetic style of, of filmmaking that's based on motion vectors, graphic vectors, a much more artistic kind of approach to filmmaking. And so Cloakey was working at USC, uh, University of Southern California, one of the early film schools that's training people to go into Hollywood. He met Vorkapik, and based on that association, made this film in 1953, which is uh, a very abstract, graphic, dynamic clay animation. About three minutes. Oops, sorry. Sorry.
so I really like that film because I think it says something about sort of the tactile nature of clay, the funky sort of inherent quality of plasticity and surface detail that clay has. Uh, that film, Gumbasia, was seen by Pat Weaver, who was an executive at the National Broadcasting Company in the United States, NBC, one of the main networks, television networks, actually the father of Sigourney Weaver, for that matter. And Pat Weaver said to uh, Art Kluge, that's beautiful, I really think that's a cool film, can you, are there any narratives you can do with it? And so Art Kluge produced 120 episodes of Gumby through the years, um, over a course of about four or five years, there's in the early 50s. And in the United States, I mean, when I was growing up as a kid, that's one of the few places you could see three-dimensional puppet animation in clay anywhere. I mean, there, there are not that many examples in the United States of puppet animation. So it is, that was always a unique feature in our sort of cultural understanding of clay. Let me ask two, I mean, I'll, let me just stop here and say, are there any questions at this point? I don't, I don't want to run through this without, does anyone have a question? I, I don't want to just keep plowing forward, but I will. So, um, very low tech kind of medium. The other thing that's cool about Gumby films is for kids, you know, many of these toys were popular toys from the day. So I've always felt in animation there's this kind of dual reading of a film where you think about, oh, look at that, that's a toy I know, then Gumby's this size. There's always this kind of embedded code of mass-produced objects and uh, sort of dual uh, technical reading that's going on as you're watching the film. So Gumby's a very low-tech, uh, simple kind of film. The narratives are very saccharine. How many people have seen Gumby? Okay. Wow. In the United States, he's huge, very big. And in fact, I, I wanted to mention this thread too. Last night I was sitting in a bar across the street over here, and I, there were two kids from the, I could tell they were animators here, and they were talking about monetizing their films. You know, we've got these great short films, how can we make money on it? And that, obviously, I used to run a film festival in Ann Arbor many years ago, and that's been a recurring issue for all short filmmakers. How do you make money out of it? And really in the United States, besides Cloakey, who actually, if you think about it, this guy's made an entire lifetime career on one figure, basically Gumby. Um, there are not too many people who have been able to really monetize the clay medium. The other person is sitting right over there, Will Vinton. If you don't know him, he's standing right in the back here. And I really appreciate you coming, Will. Thanks. And we'll talk about Will's work, too. So, on the one side, we have an occasional appearance of clay in mass media productions on television, 120 episodes on television. On the other side, we have this sort of continuing independent use of clay. And, you know, I think sometimes we forget that 16 millimeter, the Bolex, early film schools, I mean, I don't know the European history, but in the United States, became the birth of independent filmmaking in the United States. So people like Elliot Noyes, who still a, runs a production company in uh, San Francisco, in 1965 goes to one of the few places in the United States where they're allowing people to develop longer term works in animation, which was the Carpenter Center at Harvard University. And in 1965 he produced this film, and I'll let this play. This is a, again, well I won't prejudge the the playback for you. I'll just let it play if it'll play. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
For me, this is a film that sort of takes the, one of the fundamental themes of all animation, which is metamorphosis, and translates it into the very tactile, uh, low-tech, you know, funky version of clay that, that uh, is something that American audience really haven't seen. I mean, the American market for animation is dominated at this time by people like Hanna-Barbera who are producing primarily for television, uh, series like Fred Flintstone, that kind of thing, you know, very, very narrative, limited sorts of animation. So you do this kind of piece with freeform clay animation to a jazz soundtrack, continuous metamorphosis, just straight ahead, no script, as a kind of anti-version of narrative cartoon filmmaking at the time. This is 1965. So, we're jumping ahead a little bit to Closed Mondays, which is Vinton's early film that won the Academy Award in 1974. And one of the great things about this film is it required the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Hollywood to rename the category from Best Cartoon to Best Animated Short because a dimensional film had, not, had never won the Academy Award until 1974. And we'll come back to the Vinton material in a in a minute, but just to say here that you know these kinds of films began to lay a, a groundwork for clay in the United States as a workable, viable technique that could do lip sync, that could do sophisticated narratives, that could be uh, viable as a production medium uh, 
in a whole range of formats, not just for television like Gumby had done. So around this same time, and I, I'm not going to stick to any straight chronology here, but there are a number of things that begin to happen. Um, Super 8 filmmaking was, you know, a sort of a democratization of film, the film medium, in the same way that we think of digital video as a democratization of television or video production. So Super 8 filmmaking really began to take off in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, small gauge. I don't know if you know Super 8 film, but it's a small gauge format, very inexpensive. And so it becomes a place where a number of artists begin to work as independents. And the thing about clay animation is it's, it's geographically separate from Hollywood. I mean, people who are making clay animated films are not based in Hollywood. They're based all over the country, and particularly on the West Coast and places like Portland, um, San Francisco. You know, it's not, uh, it's not limited to one geographical location in the United States. And it's sort of capitalizing on this, capitalizing on this low-tech, independent, easy-to-produce kind of of technique. So people that we see doing this kind of work are people like Tim Hiddle, who in 19, I guess it was 1981 or 82, was producing short Super 8 films in clay with this figure called Jay Clay. Do people know the Jay Clay character at all? Pretty, pretty uh, continuously running character in American clay animation. He produced an early Super 8 film that was shown on Saturday Night Live. I mean, we have to go back to the early period of Saturday Night Live. Um, and they actually had early user-generated content where people could send in films. So Hiddle sent in a film using the Jay Clare Clay character and continues to use him today. I, I think we have time to get this in, and I'm just going to roll this. Uh, this is his most current film from Tim Hiddle. It's called uh, The Quiet Life. It's the recurring character of Jay Clay that he's used in all his films. In fact, he told me that it's basically the same puppet, the same wood armature, and the clay's been replaced a few times, but...
so again, without getting too kind of chronological about it, I mean, here's somebody who's working in Super 8 with a, this recurring character of Jay Clay, which is, he's a very uh, well-developed, uh, expressive body language, uh, simple kind of character without eyes. And I just love the way Hiddle's able to fly him on strings. He's very good at flying a three-dimensional character on uh, monofilament. And, uh, you know, I just think it's interesting that somebody, he's worked in many feature films, including he was one of the lead animators uh, in Jack in The Nightmare Before Christmas. So he has a day job, but he's been able to keep this kind of super eight independent character going for some time. The other people who are sort of getting their start initially in Super 8 are, are people like David Daniels, who uh, won a Young Kodak Filmmakers Award in 1973 and was making sort of, you know, traditional puppet films in clay. He went to the CalArts Experimental Animation Program. I don't know if you know, do people know the work of David Daniels? He does this style called Stratacut Animation, which is basically to, it's like the Mili Fiore technique in glass, Italian glass growing, where they take rods of glass and make a pattern and then heat the rod and slice off slices to it. He does the same thing in clay. Uh, he calls it Stratacut, where he builds these clay loaves and embeds imagery in them and then slice it away, like Oscar Fissinger's technique, uh, the wax slicing technique from the 1920s, if you're familiar with that work. But um, uh, I just want to show you a very short clip from Daniels. This is a film from... 1995, when Daniels was actually working at the Vinton Studio in Portland. It talks a little bit about his thesis film California and then his work Institute with Institute of the Arts uh, produced a film Will Vinton. titled Buzzbox, revealing a startling technique of clay animation. The student was David Daniels, and he called the technique Stratacut. Stratacut is a, uh, like th it takes its word, its name from uh, cutting earth layers up um, like a bulldozer where you'd see the strata on the side of the earth. Uh, after an earthquake, you see earth strata you know, rising up. Um, it's built in a very similar way, only I do it for controlled animation. In strata cut, plasticine loaves are constructed, placed before a camera, and sliced. The camera records each layer of imagery as it changes. Buzzbox is, uh, was an attempt to regurgitate all the television I've watched from being born till the, till the day I'll die. But at the time, all the television and all the media and all the um, images that the 20th century had put forward into my brain, uh, trying to regurgitate them all in 15 minutes um, through a medium that had never been used before in order to hopefully have people uh, be, see it afresh, see all these images afresh and be threatened uh, to walk out or to actually stand and endure it. Daniels traces the inspiration for Stratacut to his early childhood, when he apparently spent more time playing with clay than sitting in front of the tube. We started to make birthday cakes and fried eggs. And a birthday cake is um, just three, three layers or four layers of icing, you know, cream, icing, uh, cake, icing, etc. And we did this in clay and uh, cut it open, and I realized at that point that the icing and cake did not go away, that there was actually a piece of striped material left inside of the cake. And that was where Stratica came from. It was uh, something that had sort of set, you know, took a 11 or 12 years before I really had the animation tools to, to understand the principle. But I was very clear that there was something very magical in what I had seen when I was very young. On the strength of Buzzbox, Daniels landed a job in New York, where he created clay segments for Pee Wee's Playhouse. In Columbus's time, he thought the world was flat. Christopher Columbus set sail to prove the world was round. He sailed with three ships. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. <laughs> In 1987, Daniels moved to Los Angeles, where he worked on a variety of projects. I think Stratica is a beautiful thing. Um, it's a one, I like to see it as a component that works best in combustion with other kinds of styles and techniques and it's in some ways more magical because it has a contrast against other kinds of looks that you might bring to, um, might be brought to the, to the, to the uh, sort of smorgasbord of styles. In 1992, Daniels moved to Portland, 
where he directs animation for Will Vinton studio projects, such as this clear sill spot. My complexion was embarrassing. I just wanted to hide in the dark. Yuck. I tried regular cleansers, even not so regular ones. I was desperate. I wished every day was Halloween. Oh. The first step to getting clear is to get clean, and Clear Sill Daily Face Wash helps eliminate bacteria and gets rid of more dirt. It worked great, but I still like the dark. For other reasons. Clear Sill Daily Face Wash, a cleaner cleanser. As one might imagine, slicing a loaf of clay and photographing each layer is fairly simple. The difficulty of Stratacut lies in the creation of what Daniels refers to as motion sculptures. That's a storyboard in Stratacut. Just to give you some simple a starting point in your mind to conceive of the way Stratacut works, often I use the example of a cone. A cone is a geometric shape, and if you were to cut the top of the cone, you would get a, a tiny dot at the very tip. And then as you cut a slice of time away, this, this um, dot is becoming a larger and larger circle use that principle in animation throughout and you pretty much have it as far as what Stratacut does. Uh, there are all kinds of phenomena that happen when you start to have things move around in Stratacut. For example, if you have a line of clay um, the, um, and you cut it straight forward this direction, you get no animation out of it. This is anti-animation in Stratacut. And when you turn it to this, to this side, you start to s realize that as you cut away through the through this line, it will start to move from left to right or right to left. And then as you cut even further, it becomes um, wider and wider. Um, you'll start to see that it um, elongates the shape of the cut area. So you're getting, instead of sort of thin lines, you're getting thicker and thicker lines. The more closer you bring it toward the plane at which the knife cuts. The basic principles of Stratocut seem simple enough. But the process of embedding detailed moving imagery within a loaf of clay can be mind-boggling. What I have here is a, uh, I'm making a, uh, a mouth. And I wanted to show you a little bit of the architecture that goes into making that mouth. The, um, I have uh, teeth that are running along. And they have all kinds of patterned um, directional patterns inside them. This is the top set of teeth. This is the bottom set of teeth. If I flip it around, you can see more clearly how that works. Those are the, the top top and bottom um, teeth. When you see, you see as it's changing, the teeth are going away and this darker mass in the middle is showing, is, is widening out. And that is the mouth opening to sort of a hollow O, o or um, screaming shape right there. And it's coming back to a smile right here where you can see the bottom teeth merging in and the top teeth coming back. And then it's hollowing out again. Although I'm being really pugnacious in putting a um, set of buck teeth in the top of the screen, but it's sort of like an oval shape. After I've done that, I'm going to have to add the lips, and I've left them open. Right now, they, I haven't really put them on, but they are, um, they, they ride along the contour of the top, and then I have a bottom set of lips that rides along the bottom, the contour of the bottom, and I'll be twisting and shaping these to fit around, so you'll actually get an open mouth on this end, and a smiling mouth on that end. And then all, all sorts of basically back and forth animation in the middle. Um, and then I'll be taking a slice at a time. This again is a really bad, you know, very quickly done, but you get the smile on the next cut. What this mouth is doing inside this block is going like this. It's basically insanity, so it's going from a smile to a scream, back to a smile, back to a scream. I love, I love clay because it's, uh, it's a perfect medium to push and prod and pull and it's very sculpture, very sensual. So again, I mean, what you see is a number of things that I, really I think the Vinton studio begins to open up in the mid-90s where people like Daniels come to work with him. People like Joan Gratz, I don't know if you know her work, she did a film called Mona Lisa Descending, a, Descending the Staircase which won an Academy Award in 1996, I believe. 
She has a film in this year's festival called Kubla Khan. It's a clay painting film. And she actually did, in the Vinton work that you'll see in the Vinton show, she does a lot of painted, uh, clay painted skies just as background elements within Vinton's work. So a lot of people are converging at the Vinton studio on the West Coast as a sort of source of all these different techniques of clay animation in the 1990s. Um, and also just, you know, elevating the visibility of clay as a medium through winning Academy Awards, uh, through places like MTV. In the United States, we have Children's Television Workshop in Sesame Street, and that became a, a, a place where we see a number of sort of short films in, in clay animation. So again, I, I want to close just real quickly. This is a fairly long film, but this is sort of a historical approach about the Vinton Studio. And he'll, in this film, you'll see sort of lay, laid out a, a fairly detailed account of what the Vinton Studio did in the United States to make clay a viable kind of puppet medium. This is a longer film. It's about 20 minutes, so I'll just let this roll to the end. In the early days of motion pictures, innovators often experimented with various types of dimensional stop-motion animation, and they sometimes used modeling clay to make simple, malleable characters that could come to life. In 1932, one such pioneer, an Oregon filmmaker named Lewis Clark Cook, made a clay animated film called The Little Baker. However, 2D cell animation got an early foothold and quickly became the norm for animation. By the 1940s and 50s, 2D drawn animation was the dominant form, with TV shows and theater presentations created by hundreds of small and large cell animation practitioners. Model animation, or three-dimensional animation, was largely denigrated and rarely seen. By the 1960s, clay animation was completely maligned, called impractical and not suited for animation. Toward the end of the 60s, Will Vinton, a native Oregonian from McMinnville, was studying architecture and filmmaking at the University of California at Berkeley. There, he experimented with stop-motion animation, including object animation and pixelation. His interest in organic fluid forms and the architecture of Antoni Gaudí in Barcelona led Will to begin designing with plasticine clay. The filmmaking and the clay sculpting combined for creative experiments in clay animation. My fellow Americans. It was upon first viewing these experiments that Will Vinton had an epiphany about the potential of clay and 3D animation. Yes, it's a mind blower. He felt this was something that clearly deserved further exploration. In the early 70s, while working full-time as a filmmaker in Portland, Will decided to continue the experiments in clay animation. He wanted to make a film that would show off the merits of this unique but unproven medium and hopefully show others the potential he saw in it. He invited his college housemate and sculptor, Bob Gardner, to join him at his house in Portland to help. They set up a small shooting stage in the basement of Will's home and began animating. I wonder what makes it work. <laughs> An eight-minute clay animated film was completed in 1974 called Closed Mondays. Thank you for turning me on. I am a replica of the Model 505 type P Electro Brain. The film garnered hundreds of international awards and captured the first ever Academy Award Oscar for a stop-motion film. After making a commercial for Rainier Beer, Will and Bob went their own ways to work on separate projects. Will used the commercial's mountain backdrop for his next film, Mountain Music. Vinton followed this with a more ambitious half-hour film called Martin the Cobbler, based on a Tolstoy short story for non-theatrical distributor Billy Budd Films in New York.
For the general public, interest was growing in what seemed like a new animation technique that Will Vinton and his associates were exploring. To help satisfy this interest, the team created a documentary to describe the basics of their process. They called it Claymation. It was a word Will coined and later trademarked to differentiate his work from that of other clay animators that came before. The modest success of these first films created the opportunity to continue making claymation films for non-theatrical and educational distribution. For Vinton, what followed was an exciting series of experimental short films, each designed to explore the capabilities of claymation and move the medium forward. But when Rip entertained, he always drew a crowd. There are men, special men, born to Where I live, everything is very small. This experimental period was creative and satisfying, and Will built a solid team of artists dedicated to the advancement of claymation and 3D animation. Architect turned animator Barry Bruce began a 25-year period working with Will as the backbone of this 3D animation journey. The chain of life had begun. It was a process of trial and error. Some were swift, and some were strong, but one of them was clever. And it came to pass on a Christmas evening, while all the doors were shut it tight. And quicker than God could drop his hand, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods, and split the air with their wings. Indeed, these claymation films showed off an impressive range of 3D animation techniques and styles. And God said, that's good. The word dinosaur means terrible lizard. <laughs> Actually, they weren't lizards at all. They were reptiles. What happened to them, Philip? They died. <sighs> Significantly, Vinton was also experimenting and learning all about more sophisticated adult comedy and breathing life into characters in a way that had rarely been done in 3D animation up to that point. The largest of the giant dinosaurs was a plant eater. Oh, <laughs> Roosevelt, you know, day of infamy. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with... Oh, Frankie. He had a mistress, you know. <laughs> and then there were the movies. Training, training, training. The two brothers, are, you know, they're fighting, you know, they're always fighting. I'll break your face, take this Why you run, I live that bad. Well, they're getting in shape for the war. You know, they feel good about that. They feel good about that. Well, then they, then they go to the bar and drink on furlough, right? And they fight the Air Force. They fight the Navy and everything. Of course, there's no Coast Guard. Oh, and then, of course, you know, back home, there was the Andrews sisters singing uh, Bugle Boy of Company C. The films won hundreds of international awards, including four Academy Award nominations in a seven-year period. To extend the audience for these classic claymation shorts, they were packaged for college town theaters as the Festival of Claymation with dinosaur hosts Herb and Rex. I hated it. They all look like hippies. No, I give this one thumbs up. Hey, I wouldn't give these guys a job. They're perhaps a bit dated. But, but nice visual. A stylistic mishmash. Which mishman. is why I liked it. And I hated it. A fan of Mark Twain, Vinton chose the famous author's short story, The Diary of Adam and Eve, as his next production. Yahoo! I think it is a man. It has frowsy hair, no hips, and tapers like a carrot. So I think it is a reptile, though it may be architecture. By the time the diary was completed, it was decided they would add other Twain stories and create the world's first claymation feature film, The Adventures of Mark Twain. I've 
seen all the foreign countries I care to see, except for heaven and hell. And I have only a vague curiosity as concerns one of those. No, friends, I go to meet the comet. Oh, no! What's your name? Satan. Uh-oh. You, Ricky! <laughs> and he can do most anything. <laughs> you look about as disappointed as Presbyterians in hell. <laughs> well, quick, where are you from? The Adventures of Mark Twain was a highlight of the team's artistic growth and the pinnacle of their experimentation. Jettison the Superfluous! It was also an important milestone in the growth of 3D animation. The film received great praise from the critics, including Michael Medved, who called Mark Twain the most original and audacious animated film since Fantasia. Against the assault of laughter... <laughs> Nothing can stand. However, as an animated film, Twain was primarily distributed for children and missed its targeted older audience who would have better understood and appreciated it. As a result, Claymation remained largely unknown to the general public. Meanwhile, post-production guru Walter Murch approached Vinton about bringing the gnomes and Gnome King to life for his Disney movie Return to Oz. Your Majesty! She has returned to us. Not the Dorothy Gale from uh, Kansas. Yes, Your Majesty. You believe that I have stolen something, Dorothy, and you want me to give it back. Yes, Your Majesty. And what if they don't want to? Perhaps you'd like to visit my fiery furnace. Claymation had never before been used in quite the same way, and the film drew considerable attention to the art form. The technique caught the eye of the creators of the Moonlighting television series. They devised a Claymation dream sequence allowing Sybil Shepherd to be present even while she was off the show for a pregnancy. In fact, where do you get off even asking if we... You're turning me into... Addison, I'm a witch. The broom fits. What did you say? You heard me. Oh, yeah? <laughs> she turned me into a horny toad. This is the Noid. Along the way, Vinton's 3D animation and claymation work was attractive to commercial art directors, eager for a new eye-popping look for their advertisers. Pizza that just wasn't right? The Noid did it. Hamburger places serve billions of burgers, and oh yes, they also serve chicken, like chicken nuggets. But it's hard to do chicken right, part-time. So come check and save. Initially, the production of Claymation commercials was sandwiched between longer productions as time allowed. But when producer David Alchel came on to oversee commercial projects, the team's capacity for producing commercials grew. The studio could then have multiple projects in production at the same time. It could change my life. New car, new house, new rings for my wife. So even if you thought Nickelodeon was for little kids, that doesn't mean you can't change your mind. Maybe someday, toothpaste will come in flavors. Like chocolate cake. Or a big juicy cheeseburger. I am a mouth. Ah. <laughs> 
And my job is to eat things. Soggy eggs. Out to sog an innocent breakfast. Is breakfast all right? <laughs> Just remember to look out for Captain Crunch. Yeah, his cereal's got crunch power. Oh, choose the Apple Western omelet with ham and cheese and ketchup on it. Where are these Humpty Dumpty time? A hard-boiled egg. Food would be just fine. You know what upsets me? Spicy food. Oh, oh upsetting! Hot peppers! That's really upsetting. upsetting! Whatever kind of upset stomach you have, Alka-Seltzer oh, antacids help you get the fast relief you need. New Alka-Seltzer antacids. Oh, how uplifting! In 1986, San Francisco advertising agency Foot Cone and Belding approached Vincent about bringing raisins to life in 3D for the California Raisin Board using the cool Motown sounds of I Heard It Through the Grapevine. California Raisins from the California Vineyards. Enormous popularity of the California Raisins made claymation a household word, and the 3D animation work of Will Vinton Studios was becoming widely known. Interest grew in having Vinton apply his 3D magic to music videos, including Vance Can't Dance with John Fogarty. While working on effects for Disney's 3D stereoscopic movie Captain EO, Will became acquainted with rock legend Michael Jackson, who expressed interest in using claymation in his Moonwalker movie. The team created the Speed Demon section of the film, mixing claymation with live action film. With Vinton's claymation projects having adult appeal, a shift was taking place, where 3D animation was beginning to seem like a more sophisticated medium intended for all ages, while 2D cell animation, which still dominated children's television, was seen as appealing primarily to young audiences. So when television seemed a natural next step, the focus was on prime time rather than Saturday morning. CBS helped the studio launch Will Vinton's Claymation Christmas Celebration as a primetime special. <laughs> the special had excellent ratings and won multiple Emmy Awards, as did Meet the Raisins, the special which followed. like a rabbi trapped in a pig's body. No, a rabbit. A rabbit in a pig's body. Look, I've been living a lie. These and several other TV specials have followed garnered an unprecedented series of primetime Emmy Awards, beating out the likes of The Simpsons for Best Animated Program. Of the apocalypse. 
course, you don't have to worry because I'm on sabbatical, okay? <laughs> but you know what? If any of those other guys knew you were alive, they'd rip your snout off. <laughs> Mum's the word. <laughs> The growing popularity of Claymation by Will Vinton Studios, as well as by imitators and new competitors, generated greater interest in 3D films for all audiences. The term Claymation was beginning to be used commonly by people in the know all over the world. At the same time, computer animation tools were becoming more accessible to artists and they offered new opportunities to 3D animators. Vinton's team began exploring how these tools could be used. Cool Tools for Sesame Street use pure CG or computer graphic images. I smell the smell. Liar, you only smell yourself. Great is now unscented! Well, anyway, that's weird. Just bail in the middle of that. Um, I'll stop there anyway because we're getting kind of out of time. But um, uh, anyway, so again, it's sort of difficult to understate the influence of the Z Benton Studio because they're working on the West Coast, they're outside the Hollywood system, and it really became this sort of center for people like David Daniels. Uh, Joan Gratz, people who are outside the sort of traditional uh, Southern California focus for, for animation. Um, and, you know, it, it, in the United States at least, you know, if you just take The Raisins, which to my mind is not his best work at all, but for a mass audience really sort of captured people's imagination in the United States, um, it became a sort of uh, impetus for a number of different studios to go on and do that kind of work. People like Ardman, I think, in many ways, um, just sort of a, to, to establish it as a medium that could work in long-form films, of course, throughout all of the commercial work that he did, and uh, just become uh, s certainly not as widespread as 2D work, but a sort of medium that could carry year after year to make feature-length films and television shows uh, that we still see today. I mean, people like Ardman, for example, establishing a series of uh, car, uh, stars in the medium that then could be picked up by people like Wallace and Gromit. I think people just saw it as a finally as sort of a functional technique in uh, sort of on the par with. Uh, 2D animation, but obviously not one that's going to be used nearly as commonly. So that's what I have to for you today. Uh, and I do hope that you'll kind of watch, think about these sort of themes in this presentation as we go through the weekend, because there are a number of connections I think you'll see across a whole bunch of puppet films. Are there any questions? I'd glad to take any questions if you have any. Great. Well, thanks for coming. Enjoyed talking to you. Appreciate it. <clears throat>